Very good. Our first speaker is Dr. Anol Dovki, and he will start now. And there's going to be, don't be surprised, I have a timer that will be running. Yeah. So it's my turn to try to be on time this time. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to present you some data on uh, ash uh, dieback in France. Uh, be indulgent, it's only, I started to work on ash uh, dieback only one and a half year ago. I've been working on poplars for a long time. I'm still working on poplars, poplar worst. I'm going to talk about disease progress at national scale, disease progress at field scale, impact on growth and perspectives. Uh, ash is uh, the fifth broadleaf species in France in terms of uh, acreages, acre, su su superficie area. <laughs> um, we've got um, three ash species in France. The main species is uh, common ash. But uh, in the south and uh, on uh, some uh, river valleys, we've got also um, narrow leaf ash, and the two species hybridize in some parts of the of the country. And in the extreme southeast, we've got also uh, flowering ash, uh, Fraxinus ornus. Ash is the main species on only four percent of the forest area, and pure ash stands represent only. 173,000 uh, hectares in France. Hash dieback was uh, first detected in France in 2008 in this area, and it's been uh, progressing since then from, from there to, to the western part of the country. And the second, um, the second um, detection was in, in the north of France in 2009. The disease has reached Paris and it hasn't reached Orléans yet. Orléans is where I work and <laughs> I don't hope or I hope, I don't know, that it'll be there probably next year. And um, the disease progress from, these, um, from this map is around 75 kilometers a year. This, uh, it's important also that I say that this map comes from uh, data that has been um, gathered by uh, the Department of uh, Agriculture, which, uh, co um, which um, relies on, um, on a group of more than 200 um, field observers that monitor the disease um, on a 60 kilometer by six, 16 by 16 kilometer grid cells. So I'm going to present you some data on uh, one of our 17 uh, field trials. At INRA, we've got yeah, 17 field trials where we compare different provenances of common ash. These trials are in several parts of the country. Some are in diseased areas, some are not. This trial that you see here is a 19-year-old trial that is located in very close to where Calara was detected for the first time in France. And in this trial, we've got 70, 788 trees from three French provinces from the roughly the same area. There were plenty that had a spacing of four by four meters in January 1995. These are the measurements that have been conducted in this trial. So you see classic measurements like girth at breast height, height, butt flush also that has been measured once and Calara symptoms. The first detection of Calara in this uh, trial was in 2010. Regarding uh, Calara symptoms, we've measured two kinds of symptoms, Crohn dieback, CD, 
and color lesions. And on this picture, you can see that most of the time you've got several color lesions. Crone dieback was measured um, as a percentage of dead branches, and color lesions were measured as the proportion of basal, basal girth that was uh, rotten, that was dead. Um, so as you see here, this is the ranking scale for crone dieback. And this is um, an aerial picture, I mean, a special representation of the, of the field trial in 2010. And the darker the gray color, the more infected the tree is in terms of crone uh, dieback. So you see that in 2010, 93% of the trees didn't have any crone um, symptoms. And this is the evolution in three, yeah, three, three, four years. So in 2013, I mean this year, but in April this year, uh, only 24% of the trees were free from uh, crown symptoms. And one point, yeah, quite 2% of the trees reached the most, um, in the, the worst level of infection. I, when crunching this data, I wanted to see if there was any uh, correlation between the distance of a tree to the nearest infected tree a given year and the status of this tree the next year. So this is the distribution of the distance of each tree to the nearest infected tree in 2000, sorry, in 2010. So you see that this distance to the nearest infected tree ranges from zero to 30 meters. And this is the distribution of the, the number of trees. And this is for the trees that remained non-infected in 2011. This is the same thing, but for the trees that became infected in 2011. The distributions are not exactly, but roughly the same, which means that whatever your distance, I mean, if you're a tree, whatever your distance to an infected tree a given year, the next year you can be infected or not. Distance to the nearest infected tree a given year has no influence on whether a tree will be infected the next year. That's for uh, crone uh, dieback. Then I compared um, the evolution of the disease for crone, di for crone dieback uh, from consecutive, uh, between consecutive years, and this is the way the results will be, will be represented. All the, the trees will be plotted like this in this kind of um, figure, and if the trees fall in this area it means that the crown dieback is getting worse year two compared to year one. And if they fall in this area, it means that they've recovered from the disease. And you can see that for three consecutive years, 2010, 2011, and 2013, there is nothing that looks like a recovery for any tree. This is the same kind of figures, but for color, color lesions, as I said, they've been measured on this uh, ranking, no, not on a ranking scale, in fact, they were, they were measured as a continuous trait because we measured the length, the width of the color uh, lesion and divided it by the total girth uh, of the tree at the, at the color. And this, this trait has been measured only for two years, in 2012 and 2013. 13. And you see that for the first year, there were more than 70% of trees that were uh, free from uh, color lesions. And this proportion um, went down to 40% in just one year. From, the, from these figures, you can see also that color lesions tended to, to spread from the north of the trial to, to the south. And if you remember the previous figures for crown dieback, tended to be the reverse. But 
Um, again, for correlations, I tried to see if there was something that looked like a recovery. Some trees fall in this area, but remember that we measured this trait as a ratio, so it all depends on how the, the lesions grow and how the total girth um, um, grows also. So most of the trees do not show any recovery in terms of uh, color lesion. The situation is only getting worse from one year to the other. I looked at the correlation between both traits, and from this you can see that there is no correlation, no need to compute a correlation coefficient. Um, so both symptoms appear and develop independently. And you've got, we, that's for 2013. You can see that some trees here, they have neither cone dieback nor cola lesion, in fact, there are uh, 80, 84 trees that fall in this category, which means 11% um, of the total number of trees. So only 11% of trees have neither color lesion nor cone dieback. Then I wonder what was the impact on growth. What I did is I computed the relative growth increment from 2000. 10 to 2013, so the girth increment for uh, three years. So you've got, sorry, the distribution of the all the trees that are in the in the trial. So and, and here you've got the relative girth increment here. That means that the trees had an increment of 25 percent. They improved their uh, girth at breast height of 25% in three years. You see that the mean value for all trees in the experiment was 0 0.11, so 11, they increased the girth at breast height of 11% in three years. When looking at the trees without any Calara symptom, the mean is 13%. When looking at the trees that had um, cone dieback since 2010, but no cola lesion until now, the mean is 0 0.10, 10%. And when you look at the trees that had, that had uh, cone dieback since 2010 and cola lesion since 2012, the mean is only 8%. That means that, in average, having both symptoms leads to a 38% loss in three-year girth increment at breast height. So as a plant breeder, my goal is to breed resistant ash material. And there are two keywords in that, resistance and breeding. What is a resistant tree? The main question, in my opinion, is is a symptomless tree resistant or tolerant, which is slightly different, or is it just disease escape? And breeding, resistance or tolerance, if any, needs to be under genetic control to be passed from one generation to the other. So these are the two main questions that I have to answer. To answer the first question, we need interactions between bee breeders and phytopathologists. And to answer the second question, an interaction between breeders and molecular geneticists also. So that's why the Fragsback cost action is so important because it puts all these people all together to share their knowledge. Since this is a meeting for stakeholders, uh, we can wonder, maybe some of you wonder how they can help as a forest owner or manager. How can you help breeding? You can help by identify symptomless trees in infected areas. It's important to do it in infected areas to make sure that these trees express resistance or tolerance and that it is not only disease escape because the disease pressure is too low. Get as much information as possible on where your planting material comes or came from. This is an information that we lack most of the time except in our scientific experimental trials. 
help scientists also by undertaking simple measurements, such as the precocity of leaf senescence in your ash material. This is something that has been pointed out by our Danish colleagues, and I'm more and more convinced that this is a very important trait. And maybe you have many other interesting ideas, but yes, we need you. <laughs> Thank you to my colleagues and to the French Ministry of Agriculture and to the Fraxback Press Action and to all of you. No, no, I, I think disease escape is only in areas with, with very low pressure. Ah. I don't think that, uh, yeah. I, mean, I was thinking, you think of flushing or something? No, no. How do you think the disease got to your problem trial? Was it through windblown swords I'd say the most reasonable explanation is just uh, wind. Yeah, the, the disease is progressing in Europe from from east to west, and just comes from the neighboring country, maybe Switzerland. Or yeah, that's probably. That's what I understood, but we need to check that. But that's yeah, that's what I understood. I think I think leaf senescence is a kind of uh, no end for for the early leaf senescence is a, is a no end for for the pathogen because it cannot get into the the, lig the lignus tissues and that's when the the main uh, the most damaging symptoms appear when it gets into the the branch. But we've conducted only one. Um, Phenological measure, measurement in this trial, and it's butt flushing. And I didn't analyze the results for 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 this presentation, but my understanding is that yeah, senescence is more important. But maybe can one someone else can can answer the question? It seems like the trees which are the system types are the ones that shed the leaves the earliest notion, but it's complicated because you know leaf shed is also symptom. So let's come in. So it's, it's a long story. So yeah, it's that's. Here, but, but mm -hmm. There seems to be a very, very strong correlation with technology. And I can't really understand it. Uh, but once the technology data is coming up, also we get, a big, we get a much better understanding what's really going on. Yeah. But it seems to be there's some interesting thing there. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, it's very, <coughs> what you say is very important. In fact, um, some of your colleagues is, insisted on, on me that I make these measurements in France because in France we still have some non infected areas. <coughs> So we can measure leaf senescence uh, before the disease is present. So in this case, leaf senescence is not a result of the disease, but it's a character. It's a, it's a trait. It's a characteristic of the of the tree. Yeah, right. Okay, so, so, yeah. so, so we're working on this now. It came and coming out very soon, and we try to put all these things together. So there will be an option to explain these things. Because it is true, we have to be careful not to go out and look at the same technology and then interpret that as a measure of uh, resistance. Because it's not, it's more complicated. But it's true, something to do with we measure as coloring rather than as, as leaves, shedding leaves. So, well, yeah. I did the I, I, I did the first. I, I did the first measurements of um, leaf uh, senescence this year in another trial, and I tried to measure both leaf shedding and leaf uh, discoloration. Yeah. So, the next speaker is Jerry Douglas. Is this the one? No. no.
Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much to the organisers for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here to address you in this very famous Linnaean Society premises. So I've, I've been asked to speak about the responses to a emerging ash dieback at its current frontier in, in Ireland. So this is my report from the frontiers. <laughs> I'll try and give you a summary on the current situation uh, and the preparations that we're making for uh, the arrival of ash dieback, if it ever becomes really established, and the technologies that are needed to deal with it. And finally, I'll talk about the importance of ash in, in Ireland in, in general. Uh, a little over a year ago, hardly anybody in Ireland, or indeed in the UK, had heard of Chilara or ash dieback disease. But all of that changed last September when the announcement came from the UK that it was confirmed here. And then in September of la or in October of last year, on the 12th of October, we had the first confirmations in, in Ireland. And uh, moving forward quickly to September of this year, this is the number of confirmed case, cases of Chilara in the country. And you can see they're quite widely scattered. And every single one of those, these cases is associated with imported trees. And then in October of this year, uh, we have two confirmed findings on hedgerow trees associated with these imported trees. Now, to give you an idea on the breakdown of where they, uh, where they were located, uh, most of the confirmations were found in forestry plantations. Uh, the, the earlier map did not show you the horticultural uh, or ornamental private garden uh, um, findings. Um, so there was about 17 on nurseries, uh, private gardens, and then 16 in farm landscaping. This would be mostly associated with shelter belts and then roadside landscaping. We've built a number of motorways in recent years and uh, some outbreaks have been found in those. Again, I should emphasize all of this uh, material is associated with imports. And the two um, most recent findings were on hedgerow trees uh, within and near former ash plantations which were positive in the counties Leitrim and in Tipperary. So, uh, to be realistic, we cannot ignore these numbers. <coughs> these figures speak for themselves. The distribution of the uh, findings are quite worrying as well. So, we estimate, or I estimate, that we have a very, very low level, uh, extremely low level of potential infection in the country. And this gives us an opportunity in time to take some action or to prepare for what might be coming in the next couple of years. <laughs> so, this is the wave that we've seen sweeping across Europe, and Ireland is on the western front of this wave, and I'm not quite sure if we're going to have a tidal wave or just a little ripple, the way it enters the country, but I, I would like to know how long, how many years it will take before we have the kind of outbreaks we've been discussing earlier today. So we have been doing some preparation for, for this. Uh, officially, we're minimizing all potential spread of the disease. We're collaborating with um, our colleagues in the north of Ireland as well, because from a plant health point of view, the island of Ireland is considered as one unit. And um, this is, is being actively pursued in terms of surveying and um, this is being continually reviewed also. From a research point of view in my organization, we're assuming that Chilara will arrive. And we're trying to be proactive in the way we're planning uh, our response to it. So uh, we have just recently uh, begun a project which will run for four years in collaboration with Queen Mary College here. And uh, that will deal with some uh, research priorities aimed at breeding for resistance. And our first objective is to identify resistant or tolerant trees. And our second uh, objective is to develop technologies around the whole idea of uh, making resistant material available, either through the seed route 
or through the vegetative propagation route. Now, uh, fortunately, we have done quite a bit of work on the vegetative propagation route in recent years, and we also have some experience on flowering patterns in ash and in seed production. And we had a major study two years ago on the hybridization of Fraxinus excelsior with Fraxinus angustifolia in the wild. So we are quite familiar with the, the breeding system. Now, in one way, screening for resistance is our problem because, as I mentioned, I, I understand we have an extremely low level of inoculum present in the country. Uh, in continental Europe, we can find this situation, bad news trees and potentially good news trees. And the, the, the trees which are apparently healthy um, would be used as a breeding basis uh, uh, for selection. And as we saw earlier with our colleague Eric Kerr from Denmark, he's very actively pollinating these, these uh, trees. And the idea uh, is to hybridize two resistant trees if they're of two different genotypes, because we don't want to have uh, inbreeding. And before you begin your, your hybridization, uh, you need to appreciate that ash is uh, quite a little bit messy sexually. Uh, there are male trees, and there are female trees, and there are hermaphrodite trees. And um, we need to make sure that when, when we're doing controlled hybridizations, that um, we make the crosses in the right direction. Now, it, it would be ideal if we could do all of these hybridizations in the greenhouse, and um, a big pardon if we could do these hybridizations in the greenhouse, and we have some experience with trees that we grafted, and they produce flowers, and they produce seeds, in two successive years in the greenhouse. Now, these cyan woods that were used in these cases were from mature trees, because our program was designed to propagate individual mature trees that were 60 years old, selected uh, for development of polyclonal varieties. But the fact that they can produce seed, which are viable, uh, it gives us a, an inkling that perhaps we could do controlled pollinations under controlled conditions in greenhouses or in polytunnels. And then uh, the question is, can we maintain this, this uh, flowering pattern over several years? And also, can we vegetatively propagate limited quantities of seed, which would be potentially resistant? And the other question that this brings to mind is, can we accelerate the onset of flowering? So we've heard today that uh, juvenile plants, saplings in the forest, are very sensitive to, to Chilara. So it, if we were thinking about selection with high disease pressure, saplings might be a very good starting point, but then we have to wait maybe 20 years before those saplings would come into flowering. But it, have we any method of accelerating flowering as we have in, in conifers, for example? When it comes to vegetative propagation, I, I'm a bit more optimistic because we have developed a, a system for large-scale propagation of ash. Uh, these are grafted plants that come from mature trees, and they were selected for good stem form. Now, if we could select our trees with good stem form, plus tolerance to Chilara, the vegetative propagation route gives us an opportunity to provide a certain number of plants won't repopulate an entire country, but it gives us that chance. And the system is, uh, first of all, micropropagation of mature trees, then weaning those plants out to, the, out to the greenhouse, forming stool beds from which we can then take cuttings, conventional cuttings, and uh, using that. And uh, many of you see, have seen this uh, system in Dublin during the last FraxPAC meeting. We take conventional cuttings from the stool beds, which are rejuvenated. In this case, it's um, mature trees. And we can get three crops of cuttings per year from those stool beds. And potentially, a standard greenhouse of 200 square meters would give us 300,000 cuttings. So I think this, um, this system um, has some potential. And if we have, a, hypothetically, or challenged resistant trees, 
it's, it's clearly applicable. Now, our research with Queen Mary College here in London, which we're just initiating, uh, we have a number of aims for that. We want to get methods to establish and micropropagate any selected genotype. The difficulty with the vegetative propagation is that we, we have a num number of genotypes which propagate very, very, very well, and others which don't like being in vitro. And we've seen, uh, we've heard in one of the earlier speakers talk about endophytes, and indeed I can tell you there's lots of endophytes in ash trees, and they do cause a problem when you want to micropropagate them. Uh, the other point I mentioned earlier is to induce early flowering in ash to accelerate seed production. Uh, we want to develop a, a system, perhaps in the greenhouse, uh, of controlled hybridization. And finally, uh, we may be looking at interspecific hybridization with Asiatic species to broaden the genetic base and to, tr to transfer in uh, the resistance genes from, from those species. Uh, again, using the, the greenhouse um, as the, the host location for the interpollinations. The other, the other aspect in collaboration with European partners brings me again back to the problem of screening. Uh, we have some uh, already established collaborations with partners in the UK, France and Lithuania. And just earlier this year, uh, we provided two provenances of ASH to the UK where a, a network trial has been established, we heard it earlier, on 11 different sites. And they will be screened in a natural environment over the coming years. Uh, we also have about 700 genotypes of Irish and UK in existing European trials. It would be very nice to know if any uh, tolerant or resistant trees exist within those progeny tests. We plan to, to get that information. Uh, from our earlier work on plus tree selection, we have these 98 Irish plus trees that were selected for silvicultural properties. They're available to us. And uh, we don't know how they will react to uh, Chilara. The ideal would be to screen those in a country where the, the inoculum level is very high, to really challenge them and, and, and see what the reaction is for this kind of material. And the final aspect which we, we will examine is genotyping Irish and UK provenances, population diversity in Asiatic species. We have a number of Asiatic species in our arboreta in Ireland and in the UK. And in, in the longer run, matching resistant genotype profiles with profiles from known resistant trees, uh, such as the Fraxback and Nor Nornex uh, projects, with the ultimate aim of developing uh, good markers for resistance. And finally, I'd just like to give you an outline on the importance of ash trees in Ireland. First of all, from an economic point of view, we have 19,200 of ash forests, predominantly ash woodlands and forests. We have been planting about 500 hectares per year since 1990. So clearly a big economic uh, commitment has been made. And uh, for that reason, we're very careful to um, take all measures possible to minimize the spread of the disease. The other aspect is ecological. We have 300,000 kilometers of hedgerows. Anyone who's visited Ireland will know that. And finally, hurling. <laughs> now, the typical ash, I think the typical ash dieback reaction we've seen already uh, today, the dieback with the branch tips, this induces the, the the foliage below those points to grow out, the axillary buds and perhaps um, epicarmic buds as well. And however, we have a different situation in our, in our hedgerows. Many of our hedgerows are covered with ivy trees or ivy. And uh, the ash foliage that's most vulnerable is above the ivy level. So I'm wondering what will happen uh, when Chilara comes onto those trees the response would be that the shoots will grow out within the ivy canopy. So now the, the tree will be heavily compromised, I think. And I think those hedgerow trees will be more vulnerable to Chilara than their continental cousins. Now, when it comes to hurling, a very important activity in, in Ireland. Uh, hurley sticks are crafted from a single tree, but it's a game for very brave men and women. Uh, the hurley stick is made from a single piece of wood. 
uh, and it's cut into the root so that the um, the grain of the, the wood goes right into the root piece, the root butt here. Now, we import 70% of our ash trees to make these hurleys. We need a, quarter, a third of a million per year. And we've been looking forward to uh, six or seven years from now when we would be completely self-sufficient in growing our own trees from ash. But if Chilara arrives, I don't think we'll make that target. So this shows you a, a hurley in action. And ash is the only material that will respond in this way. And the hurley makers, here's, here's this guy is trying to block uh, the hurley, and you see it's bending. And that's because of the specific nature of the, the growth rings in, in the ash tree. You need to be very brave uh, to play hurley because the ball travels at 95 miles an hour. Uh, so, uh, you, you, and this guy is particularly brave because he doesn't have a helmet, as you can see. <laughs> yes. So to summarize then, uh, we want to obtain a core number of resistant and tolerant genotypes, but we're handicapped to some extent that we don't have a very severe disease pressure. So we rely a lot on our European colleagues to provide that, uh, uh, that uh, facility and ultimately to generate a supply chain of chelara that's resistant to, uh, uh, sorry, a supply chain of ash trees that are resistant to chelara. And finally, <laughs> in 2011, we were very fortunate that uh, Queen Elizabeth visited Ireland. And um, during that state, three-day state visit, she received many, many gifts and uh, I think it was very interesting that she received a, a Hurley gift because it's very symbolic uh, and it, it emphasizes the cultural importance of ash as representing uh, our landscape and our people and uh, our hurling game. So thank you very much. And I just wonder how long it will be before we'll have a, an ash tree, a Hurley made from an ash tree that's resistant to Chilara. Thank you. So we're now on to the, um, the home team, uh, and we're down to 10 minutes uh, each. I'll just stop uh, if I think I'm, I'm about to overrun. I'll stand up. I have no doubt. <laughs> <laughs> so what I'm going to do is, first of all, think about what was the evidence that we were given about a year ago to work with, and what were some of the big questions? We have a map here of the status quo with respect to recently planted and uh, the wider environment. We can separate that out into, of course, the uh, wider environment infection, some more, of course, by now. These are older data going from the beginning of this year. The recently planted infected locations, and also there was a tremendous sampling exercise carried out uh, in the uh, mainland uh, looking at also recording the negatives. It's really important to know where it isn't as well as where it is at present. Three questions. How did it get here? Who can we blame is, uh, is the subtext of, of that, of course. <laughs> how fast will it spread? And how and where should we sample? I, I guess I will cover uh, two of these. And this work is from the University of Cambridge and also from our colleagues in Rothamsted and in the Met office and uh, Matt Keeling is here from uh, Cambridge and there are some representatives too from uh, Rothamsted. So first of all the airborne incursion risk, what about that? The question was really about 
the infection being noted in the wider environment of, on the east side of the country, and then we've always been suspicious of uh, what is coming in from uh, the, um, to the further to the east of the country. You've seen this map many times about movement over time. And there's a strong hypothesis that there is airborne uh, incursion. We used a model uh, from our colleagues in the uh, Met Office. They're using it rather more intensively uh, because of the amount of computation that was required. Originally developed for uh, movement of pollution, uh, pollutants of various sorts. Essentially looking at lifting the, uh, the spores into the air, how far do they go? and how long uh, will they travel for. <coughs> the, um, the model called NAME actually identifies individual sites, and there were uh, 1,500 potential uh, sites that we looked at here contemporarily, and trace at, uh, first of all, releasing the spores at um, 7 or 8 in the morning, three-hourly interval update of the weather, and then tracing what happens. And we ran this for a six hour period, for a 12, 24, uh, up to 48 hour periods, allowing for the spores to die, which uh, responds to some of the questions from earlier as we move through here. And here's what the variation looks like uh, for the relative deposition that you would get across the, um, uh, the British Isles here. And as we go through, that's 2008, 2009. Uh, I, put, I changed my talk as I listened to the questions uh, today, and there was a question about uh, variation. You can see considerable variation from year to year. Put those together, look at the cumulative risk, and we see that predominantly, of course, there's deposition on this side of the country. So that summarizes the deposition on uh, one side of the country predominantly, and this is the relative deposition risk. One can trace back then to what was the relative strength of the sources relative to the historic weather that we had had. And the size of those dots on the, as you look at it on the right hand side, actually indicate the relative um, strengths with respect to those different spatial locations. So we have the deposition pattern and a potential uh, source location. The next uh, obvious question that we might ask is, how can we use these as predictors for the wider environment infection? And what was the relative importance between the infection from the, the, the introduced material on the trade and the spores coming in relative to how weather was changing as well over the, um, the period from 2008 to 2012? As we look at this, we used a statistical framework, and there's a health warning with everything that I tell you. I probably don't need to tell the audience that there's a health warning with models, but this is the best information that we've got at present. This will evolve over time as we get more information. Nevertheless, with this um, statistical framework to categorize the likely origin of the infection on the wild type, did it come from the airborne, is it more likely to have come from the airborne Oscar spores or spread from recently uh, planted sites? The result to date is that predominantly there's a high probability that most of those infections <coughs> on the uh, wider environment came from airborne incursion. This will change over time, of course, as we get more inoculum developing on the introduced sites. So we shouldn't ignore those introduced sites at all. Well, we think about our colleagues in, um, to the west of us because again there is what's the potential for transmission from both the UK and also uh, from the continent. And we can see again the pattern of the relative uh, deposition. And as uh, the, the pathogen moves down as it will uh, to uh, further south in France, so that will affect those patterns that are going to affect uh, these islands here. So what about predicting spread within the UK? Here we have developed a model that was originally um, uh, developed for Phytophthora remorum, first in California, then adapted for the UK, and then completely rebuilt to think about Calara. Dividing the country into lots of cells, just 250 by 250 meters, there are a lot of those. The model tracks the area of ash in each cell. And 
uh, indeed, just knowing where all the ash is has been a, a remarkable collaborative effort uh, with FARA, with Forestry Commission, and many other organizations that are in the room here now. But we needed some parameters, and parameters are in short supply. So first thing to do is to think, let's look at what the spread was like across the continent, and can we infer rates of spread from that? And there have been references to 30 kilometers a year. It's important to recognize with, with all of this that you're looking at a probability distribution. So there's a chance it could go 30 kilometers, a chance it could go several hundreds of kilometers, and you need to integrate over all of those distances. All the models I am describing are stochastic, so they're allowing for natural variability and uncertainty, including the meteorological models that I described. So in looking at uh, building an epidemiological model, which is taking account of um, spread of infection, we have compared the rate of spread across the continent developed a model, compared the simulated results with the observed data, and used that for a probability distribution for how fast the epidemic might spread. Then looking at the gray area on here is, uh, again, with our colleagues from many organizations putting together our best estimates for the density of ash within the UK. We're now going to run that stochastic epidemic over time, and you'll see the year change, 14, 15, 16. I think we only run to 22 here. With the intensity of the color showing where you're most likely to have infection occurring. It's not saying it's there. It's saying that it's most likely or it's less likely to be there. Looking at increases over time, predicted increases from this, for occurrence of infection, that's the average. But a big important feature about using stochastic models is, of course, that you're going to do your best to show the variability that, and the uncertainty within the system. There is 30 seconds to tell you one more thing, and that's from our colleagues in uh, Rothamsted, and Stephen Parnell, in particular, has worked on this. If you look at the distribution of uh, ash, and it'll only take me 30 seconds to say this, and you look at where uh, you think the disease is going to spread, you put those two together, which is a hazard and this distance to known positives, that helps you to identify where it would be most effective to sample. So if you've got limited effort, you want to know where it is, where should you put that effort? And those green dots in there are indicating that. Thanks to a range of people in uh, the University of Cambridge, Frank Vandenboss, my long-term colleague from Rothamsted, apologizes that he couldn't be here today. And also, we've been very fortunate in having interactions with the Met Office. Thank you. I put the queen back on just for good measure. We've done, uh, so what happens is we assume that as soon as they get airborne, if not before, they begin to decay. So we have an exponential, <coughs> rapid exponential decay with respect to time. We don't know yet how long that should be, and some simple experiments need to be done on this. But no, that was why we looked at a whole range for six hours transport right through to 48 hours transport. In fact, uh, there is relatively little difference in the relative deposition rates um, once you get above 12 hours or thereabouts. But note that the spores are dying exponentially right from the start. We also allow for wet and dry deposition and the conditions for takeoff. And look at the sensitivity analysis to this too.
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be here. I feel mildly embarrassed, in fact, talking today because, of course, um, we at Forest Research have come rather late to the Kalara party, but maybe that's because quite a bit of our time has been taken up with the remorum, the acute oak decline, and the Dothostroma needle bite um, parties instead. Um, so what I'm going to tell you are really some of the things that we've been doing over the last year. Um, but I think it's probably a good idea just to recap, uh, really just to highlight to you how recently things have been unfolding in Britain. And that first finding was made of um, Kalara on nursery trees, imported nursery trees, and made by Ferrer in March 2012. And the next finding was in May 2012, and those were trees that had been planted just that winter in a car park landscaping development, and it turned out, out of the 500 ash trees that had been planted there, apparently showing no symptoms when they were planted over winter, about half of them were then symptomatic as the trees flushed and came into the leaf. So we really have some illustration of how trees can um, look without symptoms and develop symptoms very quickly, although I suspect in that uh, consignment of trees, some of them probably did show symptoms. I'm pretty sure most of them didn't. And then things moved on very rapidly from that with surveys that were then undertaken uh, later in the year, particularly in November, throughout the UK, and quickly established that um, the disease was present in the wider environment, particularly in the eastern part of um, Britain. And you've seen this map um, shown in different incarnations, I think. I've got the black dots and the grey dots. And the one thing I really want to draw attention to there is um, not those black dots, which really Chris has been talking about, which are the disease outbreaks in the wider environment, but all those grey ones, which are more numerous. And we know that because these surveys have continued, these reports have continued. So we know that really around this time this year, we've got something like about 600 uh, notified outbreaks, um, some of those in nursery. So obviously there's the smoking gun there of uh, infected trees uh, in the country and then moving out onto planting sites. And then um, a large number, over 300 of those sites, those infected sites, coming from recently planted trees. And then the balance of that, the ones in the wider environment. So um, we can debate the windborne spores, but it's also very clear that there have been infected trees and those trees have been planted out. And then the disease can be detected in that way associated with those recent plantings. And um, we've also seen, um, apart from um, really that massing of the outbreaks in the wider environment along that eastern part of Britain, that there are some other outbreaks in that wider environment, very limited, and I've shown them, for example, in two places there, in South Wales and also in the West Country, where apparently um, the outbreak has then gone on to spread beyond that recent planting, but does seem to be strongly associated with it as well. Now, Thomas told us a, a little bit about um, imported trees and, and uh, the movement of the disease over longer distances. And I should say that from time to time over the last four years or so, I had worried emails from my colleagues in Europe saying, Joan, you need to do something about this ash dieback. Stop this importing of trees. I think they felt I had far more influence than I really had. But. Anyway, so I, I think this um, table really is quite interesting because it shows the number, if we look at um, the information that can be drawn from the forest reproductive materials, um, the imports of ash trees coming into Britain from other European countries. And that isn't all of them, but those are the ones that I chose as really the major exporters to Britain. And where I put that purple coloration, looking back in hindsight now in many cases, we now know that disease was recorded at least in one part of those countries when those exports were going on. So in a lot of ways, we have this evidence of the movement of this pathogen on infected rootstock. So what have we been doing over this last year since these first discoveries early last year? Well, a lot of our time has gone into diagnosis of field samples, and I know our colleagues at Ferra have been very much doing that as well. 
Um, but we've also been looking at, um, to some extent, at the biology and the epidemiology of cholera or hymenoscypus. Uh, and also, I'm going to talk a little bit about that, but some of the work that's done by my non-pathology colleagues, because it's not all just focused on the pathogen, but some work that's been led by um, Steve Lee, this mass screening of ass seedlings for resistance, or maybe we should really be calling it less susceptibility or tolerance, and some work that's also been done by Trevor, who's in the audience, looking at propagation using tissue culture to bulk up Fraxinus excelsior. So really parts that will um, support this whole idea or this whole concept of looking for tolerance in our population and how this can be um, rolled out um, as quickly as possible as well. So I want to start off just really by giving a little recap on some of um, uh, this work that's been done on the mass screening. And this has been really a, a, a huge enterprise that's had to be achieved very quickly and also has been really undertaken with funding from DEFRA. And the idea was, it, it, apart from just trying to find individuals of ash trees that would show some tolerance to the disease. It also took into account that really we moved from a position of ash being traded very freely in the UK to a position where um, the disease was present uh, and a lot of nurseries were holding an awful lot of ash seedlings and could they be used in any um, meaningful way really to give us information about um, cholera. The original idea, and this really uh, was initiated in February this year, was to plant something like a quarter of a million um, saplings or seedlings over a total area of 50 hectares in areas of high inoculum pressure. In other words, in those areas of the east of England, East Anglia, Kent, um, a little bit further west into Lincolnshire, where these little trees would really be in the teeth of the disease as it's been developing in Britain. Um, the planting that went on, 15 provenances of ash have been selected. You can see the breakdown of where they've come from. Um, 14 different sites have been planted out. And there was the original aspiration of a quarter of a million. What could be planted in that time between February and June was more like uh, 155,000 saplings planted over something like a 48 hectare area in total. And so far, um, survival has been good, um, but those little trees will also have to struggle with weeds around them with some control, not only the inoculum of cholera as they come into contact with them. So that's really a big experiment that is in train, and we're really waiting to see what comes out of that and monitoring those trees to look for any individuals that do show signs of tolerance or less susceptibility to the disease. In terms of the work that we're doing currently on the biology and the epidemiology, well, of course, we had to get to grips with um, um, learning how to culture and deal with this um, particular pathogen. Um, but initially, I think we um, had quite a bit of good success with that. And it was very clear just by characterizing those isolates and testing them for mating type, if you like, the two sexes of, of uh, Hymenoscypus pseudoalbidus, that you could go to a single nursery where there were infected trees and very quickly pick up those two mating types, and certainly so on recently planted sites and in the wider environment. So all those signals are there that we have a breeding population of Hymenoscypus. Another question that I think is an interesting one, and Jan has really alluded to it in some ways, and it's something that really we're conscious of in forest research as we try and track some of these invasives and try and intercept them early on, that often by the time we are dealing with particular pests or pathogens, they may have been established for some little while, although the symptoms have only become apparent very recently. So what we're really trying to do is um, get some idea of how long the disease has been present um, in Britain. And we know that there are some sites that were planted in the late 90s where there are all the signals that the disease has been there, um, but it hasn't moved into an epidemic phase or has only recently started to do so. Um, in terms of the biology and the epidemiology, some of the work that's been done by Jesse Needham, who's a student working in our lab, we're looking at um, uh, some of the issues around um, the fruiting, the ascospore release, and what the temperature and the environmental constraints are for this particular fungus. 
I am pretty impressed that it can produce these ascospores spores that will germinate from anything from just over 2 degrees up to 30 degrees. But what it can do and the temperatures it can germinate are, are, are more constrained when you are looking at the linear growth rate of that fungus. Um, but it certainly gives you some idea of the sort of ranges of temperature where it can survive, although we're not sure for how long. But the other thing that we've been doing is looking at um, what we call the vegetative compatibility system or the self-non-self -self recognition of this fungus in culture. And, and a, a little bit like we were seeing with Barbara, here we've been pairing up, uh, going out to sites, very local sites where we might be sampling trees over a very small area, uh, a few square metres, getting those isolates back to the lab and then pairing them up. And you will find almost invariably, unless you pair uh, an isolate up against itself, if you're pairing different isolates against each other, they recognize each other as being different, and you get a particular reaction between the isolates when you pair them up in culture. And here you can see this very distinct gap between two different isolates and this area of pigmentation between them. Now, this um, self-non-self -self vegetative compatibility system really has a lot of implications when it comes to the behaviour of this fungus. Firstly, it's all more evidence indicating the level of diversity of the fungus that we're seeing in Britain uh, at an individual genotype level. But as I say, it has implications for how the fungus may behave when it comes to the infection process. Um, we know from other fungi, other pathogens, where you have quite a number of genotypes, then they will compete against each other, and that could happen on the leaf surface. If you have a number of spores <coughs> landing there, a number of ascospores that are all genetically different, they may be competing with each other and even impeding the process of infection. So it may be a lot of spores doesn't mean that's all good. Fewer spores may be better. Um, it also has implications for the spread of viruses that might be used in the control of this particular pathogen. Where you have incompatible reactions, you don't get fusion between mycelia, and typically viruses spread between mycelia by hyphal fusions. So I think knowing about this system also will give us a lot of clues into its behavior, a lot of cues into its uh, diversity, and how it affects and how it will operate in the field. And I see Barbara standing up there, so I'm just going to say I really want to um, acknowledge all the people who are working at Forest Research um, in the pathology group on um, Hymenoscopus. Thank you very much. Okay, so, yeah, I'll be as quick as possible. So firstly, I'd like to, of course, thank the organisers for this kind invitation to come here today and to represent the Nornex Research Consortium. And so today I speak on behalf of 11 different institutes and universities who all come together to formulate this Nornex Research Consortium. So as we already know, at the, towards the end of last year, we first identified this Calara dieback of ash in the wild here in the UK. And this was identified by one of my colleagues, Anne Edwards, uh, um, who is a plant scientist, but also um, works as a warden in Ashville Thorpe Lurwood, just below Norwich. And she was working together with Steve Collins from the Norfolk Wildlife Trust. And they found it out in the wild. And so as scientists, really the, the number one question that came to our mind as this was one of our colleagues was how on earth can we actually respond to the threat that's posed by this particular disease. And so we came up with four really key areas that we wanted to work on for this particular project. One was to follow an open access model to make sure that all of the data that we generate from this project is made publicly available as soon as it's ready so that you guys can all come along and access this data and help us to annotate it. Secondly, we wanted to generate some kind of tools that could be useful for helping to select tolerant ash trees. And then, of course, we don't want to forget the enemy, the pathogen itself. And so we wanted to get a better understanding of this pathogen using various different technologies, 
including genomics and pathology. And then finally, we wanted to really use the best resource that we have, which is each other, and formulate a really good consortium which would be best positioned to tackle this issue. And so we came together and formulated the Nornex Consortium, and we were very fortunate that earlier this year, BBSRC and DEFRA funded our research consortium. And so the main aim is really to understand the pathogenic nature of the fungus and to potentially uncover some of the characteristics and the genetics behind resistance or tolerance in ash. And so I'll just take you through these four main points. So the first is the open access model. And we generated this website called OADB, and you can go there and have a look at the data that we've got. And this is really an, init an initiative to fast forward collaboration on Kalara dieback of ash. And through this website, you can get access to this data repository called GitHub. And we use this GitHub data repository to deposit all of the data from this project. And so you can get access to all of the raw data and all of the annotations that are made from this project. And you can see already quite a few people are signing up and they're also contributing really vital annotations to this particular project. And so it's really important that we let the experts at the data and people who have been working on this for some time and also experts in tree pathology. And so now I'll go through the progress we've been making with the tree genome. So we selected tree 35 working with Eric and we decided to pursue this one for generating a tree, tree genome. And so this is currently underway. We have an assembly, although it's still fragmented. And so the next point will be to really utilize other technologies to join this better together. And we also have a transcriptome. This week we released a new version of the transcriptome and this is very well assembled. And so of course the next steps will be to improve this assembly from the genome, potentially to make then a genetic map and also to use transcriptomics for association genetic studies. So what do I mean by this? Well, um, Eric has the, these graphs of a diversity panel, so 185 Danish genotypes, which vary from the more susceptible end to the less susceptible end. And <coughs> we now have extracted um, RNA from all of this diversity panel and sequenced this. And we also have phenotypic data from Eric which really classifies them along this spectrum. And so then we can combine this data together. And at this point in time, we're actually at this stage. So the next step will be for us to move on and combine this data together to really associate any of the differences in the gene sequences or the expression profiles with disease susceptibility. And really the final, sorry, the final aim will be then to generate some genetic markers for reduced susceptibility. And then we really hope that we can use these genetic markers to potentially identify some um, more tolerant trees within the UK environment. Okay, so now we mustn't forget the enemy. So what progress have we been making on the pathogen side? Well, we have now got a genome sequence of a UK-specific isolate. So this was identified in and purified from Kenninghall Wood and is called KW1. And we have now got the genome sequence. We've assembled it. Although it's a little bit fragmented, it is um, a lot of the gene space we predict has been covered. The genes are mostly complete in their sequence, and so we've moved on with the annotation phase. And um, we have actually got a lot of data, which is up on the website, which you can have a look at. Um, but one of the things that we've managed to identify is these 80 rich repeat islands within the genome. So here is the genome. This is a small fragment of the genome, which goes like this. Here's the repeat area within the genome, so there's a lot of repeats here. The GC percent is very low, and the read coverage is very high. So this just means that this is potentially a collapsed area of the genome where you have a lot of repeats. So it's an 80-rich repeat island. And there are many of these within the genome. You can see even within this section, here's another area here. So this was really one of the things that we identified from the genome, one of um, many things that we've managed to identify. OK, so now we have a genome sequence, and we have sequence data from this Hymenoscyphus pseudoalbidus. The next question then is how related is it to the albedus? And this question has, has been answered in some way um, already. So we already know that these two guys are very, very different to each other. This is important because the albedus is um, the non-pathogen, the native decomposer that was already present here in Europe. And so we wanted to really show that. 
And then secondly, because we have some sequence data for a variety of different isolates, we have um, isolates from the UK, so from England, from France, within the consortium, and also we've sequenced two from Japan. So what we can see is actually that the two Japanese isolates, which are shown in green, the length of these branches indicates the diversity. And so you can see that there's a lot more diversity between these two than there is within this clade, which represents the European isolates. But furthermore, you can also see that when we look at the French ones and we look at the UK ones, the French ones are really embedded within that clade. And so there's no geographical separation between the French and the um, UK isolates. So potentially the UK Hymenoscypha pseudoalbidus might be likely to be derived from an incursion of multiple isolates from mainland Europe rather than coming in as a single isolate and then spreading. Okay, so then I'd just like to thank all of the consortium and of course all of the funders. There's also Nuffield in here who funded a studentship over the summer that was very productive. And I'd like to thank everybody who contributed to all the data that's been analysed within the <laughs> GitHub repository so far. And I'd also like to thank all of the players of the game Fraxinus, which also contributes to this, but I haven't got time to discuss today. And thank you very much for your attention. You were very quick. Very quick. Yeah. <laughs> that's good. Yes. Yeah. So it may be that it lacks, for example, the uh, hypersensitive response to the fungus. So uh, would your um, mapping efforts be able to identify I think something that wasn't there rather than something that is there? Yeah, so I think we should be able to generate these um, genetic markers. I think it's important to also look at the whole diversity panel that we have because they will go across the whole spectrum. So if there are things which are important for tolerance, we can also look across the whole panel to see what those so might be including. The missing, yeah, there could be some genes which are missing. It's sometimes difficult to be able to identify genes that are completely missing and say with 100% confidence that something is missing. So, but I think there is potential for that. I'm not sure if I should thank Rimvis for asking me to do this because I'm not a, an entomologist, I'm a, I'm a pathologist. But uh, because, probably because I've been banging on in the press about uh, emerald ash borer as another, and as you'll see, rather severe threat to our ash trees. And the fact that certain people know me or knew me as Dr. Doom. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not Doomy at all. Anyway, um, this particular threat coming in uh, heading our way. We'll get to whether it'll actually get here in the near future or not, but uh, it looks fairly menacing there, doesn't it? Of course, it's not actually quite as big as that. Um, it's, it's quite a cute beast. Uh, emerald ash borer, Agrilus planipennis. It's cute, but it, it's a menace, and it gets into trees, and it wipes them out, and it wipes them out in their millions, as you'll see, uh, in a minute. Obviously, it's, it, as far as we know, it's not it within the EU yet. It's certainly on continental Europe. But a lot of the information we know about it comes from North America, where it's probably been for at least 15 years or possibly more. Um, why it kills the trees, uh, the adult, the female adult fertilized, lays her eggs uh, just underneath the bark surface. They hatch, the grubs uh, come out. Uh, you saw the grubs on the, uh, or one, larva there underneath the bark and it feeds on the phloem and it doesn't form nice um, symmetrical galleries like ips or ips typographus or um, uh, the scolitis scolitis does in elm for instance it it wiggles all over the place and then the tree is loaded with plenty of larvae and it eats out the phloem 
so there's no uh, transport system effectively. It messes up the xylem, but it, it eliminates the phloem. And trees of lots of different sizes are, are colonized from 10 millimeter diameter upwards. Sorry, I should have said a lot of these slides come from Dan Herms in Ohio State University, who's worked a lot on this. And the rest are from uh, a colleague, Yuri Baranchikov, in one of the institutes in, um, in Siberia. Uh, this is a picture from uh, Russia. It's fairly small uh, ash. They're probably American ash, I should say. A lot of the work in Russia has been done around the Moscow region. It's the uh, um, Fraxinus pensylvanica that's being killed by them in the Moscow region, so planted trees. Now, the, the nearest tree to us there has the, uh, or has been invaded by the emerald ash borer. And we can tell that by this little D-shaped, albeit tilted 90 degrees anti-clockwise, exit hole of an adult beetle as it's emerged from that tree. So the tree is dead. Right. So here's some pictures from the States which show the sort of extent uh, of the killing. This uh, top left, that's taken in, uh, I think, late spring, early summer. And uh, all those ash trees in the avenue there, you see, have gone. And uh, various uh, states there, uh, sorry, states of, uh, of loss rather than different states. Apparently, it's in about 25 of the US states. But wind breaks, it doesn't matter where the trees are. The uh, emerald ash borer doesn't give a damn about that. And uh, somewhere near central Moscow, um, this particular gallery, uh, yeah, I probably could have pronounced the name of the gallery, uh, but you can see the extent of the dieback there over a few years. And they're obviously trying to prune out the dieback in the futile hope that it's going to make a difference ultimately. It isn't. The trees will, are probably dead by now. Um, some data on how much it's costing in the USA. So it's fairly uh, eye-watering figures. $10.7 billion in 25 states for various uh, treatments, as it's euphemistically called here. Basically, it's, it's um, uh, cutting the trees down. Replacement of more than 17 million ash. And then just in Ohio State, up to about 2007. So that would have been in the first five years after they noted it was there. They were looking at 5.2 billion US dollars to try and clear up the mess. Uh, and it is a mess, yes. It, it doesn't, it's not fussy about what species of American ash it hits. Um, and the reports from there are that Excelsior is certainly susceptible. I, I don't know whether they see major differences in, in Excelsior there. Right, where does it come from? Uh, the green area in China, apparently, and Japan, and that orange, area of the uh, extreme east of uh, Russia itself. That's the native range of the emerald ash borer, and there's a little close up there to show the, the part of that little, uh, little um, sort of land peninsula of Russia down to Vladivostok where it's native. But somehow it's got from there, now we're not going to pretend it's actually uh, flown across the rest of Russia to get to the Moscow region. Oh, sorry, it's distribution in, in the state. It, it's widely distributed within, you know, 20 years, maybe less, of it actually being imported there, into the, probably into the East Coast or into one of the ports on the Great Lakes or one or more of the ports, rather. Um, and there's where it is in Russia. It's in that far eastern range, and it's in Moscow. It's written in Russian, but I'm sure you can uh, translate that. Uh, even I can translate that. And uh, the official line until earlier this year was that it was about 250 kilometers uh, to the west of Russia. We're thinking of how, how far it's spreading. Yeah, I, I know. Rimvis is making signs at me. The official line until early this year. <laughs> I did have specific there. Um, but in fact, as we discover, and it is frequently the case, uh, the reason they hadn't found it any further west than that was because they hadn't bothered looking. That was how far they got on their day trip, probably. And, um, and in fact, when it was some forest research uh, entomologist went over under Fraxback this year, and they found it was 450 kilometers uh, from Moscow, which coincidentally is the border there with Ukraine. Uh, and I would suggest, and they suggest, that's a better way to put it, that it's, it's in the Ukraine already. 
And the Ukraine, of course, is one step away from the EU into Poland. Um, and I would think it's probably uh, at least on the borders, if not actually in Belarus by now as well. Uh, there's where they thought it was, and it's actually a, a dam site further than that. Uh, you've seen this map several times. There's nothing between the border of the Ukraine and Belarus there to stop it getting throughout the range of uh, European, of uh, fraction ex Excelsior uh, at all, right to the west of Spain, except for us. We have that little, those few miles of uh, sea between the continent and us. Will that be enough? I don't know. And how did it get out of its native range? Well, surely in, uh, in transport systems. Solid wood packaging is, is the one we would probably point the finger at now, which has been better regulated since the time it would have spread from uh, uh, the east of Russia into the west. But uh, still, it's only as good as uh, how, how it's implemented, the regulation. So maybe road haulage as well, that was a guess, but uh, pallets, dunnage, and so on. In the States, they found a lot of the outlier infections, infestations, beg your pardon, it's not a pathogen, um, resulted from the movement of infested ash trees um, as firewood. So people in New York State will um, get their... Um, motor home out, as we would call them, the Winnebago, whatever, the gigantic thing that's got a motor in it. And for some reason, in New York, they'll get ash timber or whatever and put it in a trailer on the back, and then they'll drive 3,000 miles across the States with the ash wood in the back. And uh, <laughs> just, I don't know why they don't buy where they go, but that seems to be a, the, the way they tend to do things there. I'm sure they have their reasons. Uh, and so that is one of the ways that these things spread, including the emerald ash borer. Um, conclusions, the uh, rate of flight uh, that has been measured under lab conditions, uh, admittedly, they reckon the borer could fly some 10 to 15 kilometers a year. But like was mentioned earlier, that doesn't take into account the, um, the, the eddies, the, the sweeping winds that are brought on along roadside and things like that, uh, which would probably take them further. The insects themselves might land on trucks, on cars, on any vehicle, trains, and be carried on those uh, a lot further than they would actually fly. So um, we, we can't say that just because they might fly for 10 or 15 kilometers, that would be their only spread within a, a season. They think that it's been introduced into, into Russia several times from the east, in, sorry, into Moscow several times from the east. And uh, as I said, it's almost certainly present in the Ukraine and probably Belarus as well. So uh, heading our way, as I said. Um, there is a, the, the Americans have been, sorry, the USA people have been over to its native range and are looking at various biological control options. Uh, biological control of insects, you're looking at a balance. It's not gonna stop the thing operating altogether. And a few things that I chucked in as uh, potential questions. Will it cross the channel? <laughs> we, you sort of hope not. <laughs> but these things do seem to have a way of finding the way across, with, with the exception of Colorado beetle, as Martin would point out, I'm sure, um, <laughs> which has been there in France for a long time. Uh, how susceptible is European ash to emerald ash borer? Uh, it looks as though it's very susceptible, but it takes longer to die than the American ash, uh, or certainly the Pennsylvanica that was planted in the Moscow region. And how will the uh, dieback situation that we see now interact with the, uh, with the emerald ash borer? My fear is that we've been hearing all day, and, and as I, I said earlier, it was Judith actually called me Dr. Doom, um, the, oh, we've been hearing about all these lovely resistant trees that we're going to get, but they're just going to be food for the emerald ash borer. And, sorry guys, uh, that's it anyway, thank you. <laughs> Infected by homeozygous, it isn't resistant to that, but it's very tolerant. 
So I'm sure that within the Manchurian population, there'll be some trees that are badly affected by either of these organisms. Uh, most trees will be very tolerant, uh, and some might be resistant and not get affected at all. So, but it, it's in balance there. So the parasites, the parasites. In many bar beetles, uh, it's actually not the beetles that kill the trees, it's associated with happy fungi. Is there anything known about that in the uh, I, I don't know of anything that's associated with the emerald ash border. And the people who are working on it at, at Ohio State, if there was, they would have found something. And I'm sure they would have told us, but uh, it's not being mentioned. Okay, just another bit. Exactly a week ago, in St. Petersburg, there was an entomological conference. Okay. There were two papers presented uh, uh, from the last update, the people that are working on the field on an Arizona forum. I think you well predicting the future, but the actual picture is not so dramatic yet. So basically, the, 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 the furthest find west was to that red line, not to the blue arrow that you want. Was it? Yes. Ah. And it's taken from this paper. paper. But what they emphasized, that during this summer, it went very far southeast. Nevertheless, it's not in the Ukraine yet, no, but most should. likely it will be. But it's uh, somewhere maybe uh, 60 to 80 kilometers from the border of Ukraine. That was fine. Also, they believe that so far uh, south it was transported, it's not by natural flight, so by some wood material or something like that. And also, there are two hypotheses for coming it into Russia. One is actually, as you say, from the Russian Far East, and the other actually is from the United States with this ash uh, of um, the, the information I got was from Baranchikov. Was he at the meeting? Or? Yes, he was. But I was not. But I was <laughs> not. <laughs> and I had this paper. Yeah. Well, more short. A very short comment, I think, <clears throat> if there is any resistance in, in our ash tree, I think we should think about this. Um, and not being too narrow-minded in, in the genetic variation, we, we say in the resistance against uh, Calora. So we have, have something to work on with this guy if it comes to our part of the world. So we have the final words from Dr. Well, I'm down to speak about two things, but I'm sure that we're all more interested in finding what the uh, Linnaean Society wine cellars have in store for us uh, than having one more talk. So regarding the, the uh, British Ash Genome Project, um, please just Google Ash Genome <laughs> and um, you'll, you'll find out what I would have said uh, approximately. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Thank you to our speakers from uh, Europe who have uh, come such a long way to speak to us. Thank you, especially uh, those of you for whom English is not your first language, which, is, of course, is, is most of you. Uh, we Brits sometimes forget that other people have to speak English when it's not their language. Um, so thank you for that. Um, videos will be available afterwards on the websites and hopefully on YouTube of the talks that have been given today. As we leave, could we all please hand in our badges because the Linnaean Society will recycle the plastic um, covers on other conferences. The last drink will be served in the library at 6 o'clock and we all have to be out of the front doors by 6.30, please. Otherwise, we'll incur additional charges. <laughs> Is that a, a question? Uh, the PowerPoints will be within the videos for all of the talks except one where uh, there's some unpublished data that, that is not to be shared. But other talks will have the slides within the videos. Another question at the back. I would like to get into the with Mr. Paul Cannon. I don't know you, but if you're here, please come. <laughs> so Paul Cannon, JP would like to see you if possible. Well, I'm sure we're all leaving much better informed than we were before about ash dieback and the emerald ash borer. Thank you, everyone, for making this such a good conference.